Welcome to Mindful Moments, exploring mental health and the power of prayer. Together, we'll discover tools for a balanced mind and a peaceful heart. Let's begin this journey to well-being and spiritual growth. So in case you didn't notice, I'm black. Just thought I'd establish that baseline. What's less apparent is that I'm African-American. What's even less apparent is that I am a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a friend, I'm an introvert. I am someone that you can have a conversation with for a couple of hours and I've never really disclosed anything about myself. That's me. And that's not unlike many of you as well. When we deal with the multiplicity of our identities. But what I didn't understand, and I had to learn it the tough way, was that oftentimes all of those pressures of trying to balance those different identities, if you're not careful, can be too much to bear. So about a year ago, I had my introduction, if you will, to mental health when I was awakened. I was sitting in my office in my nice, cushy corporate job, paying good money. And I was on a conference call, if you can imagine, a video conference call, because nothing's just audio anymore, right? So I was talking and I was engaging. And then all of a sudden, I got a lump in my throat. I physically could not swallow. My mind started to get really hazy. I couldn't have a, a one train of thought. So I excused myself from the call. I asked him to postpone it. Wasn't sure what was going on. So I said, let me go get a drink of water. So as I'm on my way to the kitchen area, I'm passing by folks and they're talking to me and I'm in a haze. I have really no idea what they're saying. So I knew something was wrong at that point. So I went to the admin who sat nearby just so she could know something's going on. And while I was talking to her, my teeth started to chatter. My legs started to tremor. And at this point, I didn't know, am I having a stroke? Is something going on? Is my family going to be OK, my children? So she said, listen, we're going to the emergency room. So she drove me to the emergency room. I'm texting my wife saying, hey, I don't know what's going on. She's freaking out. So I get to the emergency room, and they have me hooked up to the most expensive of devices, cardio machines, EKGs. So I'm there for a few hours. The doctor comes in and says, Mr. Fletcher, we don't really see anything physically wrong outside of some of your vitals are elevated, but we just think that's because of what's going on. They sent me home. Two days later, it happened again. Worse this time. I'm in the emergency room again, running through a battery of tests, not really knowing what's happening. And then after all of the specialists left, unsure what was going on physically, one doctor came in and said, Mr. Fletcher, Sean, how are things at home? How's your job? How is your stress and anxiety levels? Because nothing is wrong with you physically, even though it feels that way. These are symptoms of anxiety. And he also told me, he said, you know what? There's a good chance that your body gave you warning signs many years ago that you ignored. And he said, this was your second warning. He said, I suggest that you do something about it before you get the third warning. So I went on this quest of trying to understand. Once I knew I wasn't dying, I went on this quest to try to understand because it became a regular occurrence. It was something that once it was turned on, I just couldn't turn it off for some reason. 
So then I started to try to understand, and there was one symptom, one symptom that served as the catalyst that sent me on this journey to try and understand it. And it was a simple rash. Now, it's not what you think. Well, actually, it is. It's pro it probably is what you're thinking. It's a regular rash. But the interesting part about it is that once I got the courage, once I, I put aside some of the shame and the stigma that goes with, I was in the hospital for something mental health related. What's wrong with me? I mustered up the courage to talk to my brother. So I called him. I said, man, you wouldn't understand. This happened to me. I was in the emergency room. I didn't know what was happening to me. I didn't know if this was it. And I said, you know what, man? One thing that I had that I remember that kept popping up over the years was a rash. It would pop up on the back of my neck. Same spot. Not an inch to the right, not an inch to the left. Same spot. And he said, you know what, man? I used to get the same thing. And I went and saw a professional. I went to the Cleveland Clinic just to talk some things through. I said, huh, I didn't know that. I stored that conversation in the back of my mind. So then I, I talked to my father. And one thing you have to understand, my father struggled to understand why I would want to leave a job that was so high paying, provided for my family, a status symbol. You see, you have to understand, and one thing that I understood was that my father comes from a generation of prideful African-American men to where you don't just leave a job. Because what he knew and what I learned is that still, unfortunately, people of color still end up doing jobs. And the performance that we do in that job oftentimes plays a significant factor. And if other people of color coming behind us will have those same opportunities. That's why when you hear us say we do it for the culture, that's the emotion behind it. So he says, son, I don't get it. And I explained it to him. And I said, the job is great, but it's killing me. And he started to understand after a while. And he started to get it. And he said, you know what? When I was raising the five of you, I also got a rash. And he said, I never saw anybody. But I also had what I learned later on in life that were symptoms of mental health. And I didn't know what to do. So it continued me on this journey after having these encounters with my family to try and understand why was there this silence? Because I know we were young, I understand from my father's standpoint. But at some point, having the conversations, we talked about everything. We talked about life. We talked about sports. We talked about politics. My upbringing was respectable, respectable. From the standpoint of knowledge imparted upon us, nothing was left out. However, when it came to these conversations, never happened. So I wanted to understand it was my siblings, my friends. I had a friend that was one of my best friends I grew up with, had chronic diagnosis of depression and anxiety. I never knew until recent years. How much more could we have helped one another? How much more could we have been that support system to one another had we had the, the muscles and the strengths of discourse? So I wanted to know more, not just for my journey, but also within the African-American community at large. So the academic in me went to the research. I wanted to understand more about it. So, a few things that I learned is that African-Americans are 20% more likely, according to uh, the Office of Health and Human Services, 
20% more likely to experience serious mental health problems than the general population. And those include major depression. They include attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, and unfortunately, as we're seeing more and more in our society, suicide. So with that, I also learned going through the research from the National Alliance to End Homelessness, I also saw that there were two more risk factors that enhanced or increased the risk of being subjective to a mental health condition or illness. One was homelessness and the other was exposure to violence. And while African Americans only comprise 13% of the U.S. population, we comprise 40% of the homelessness population. And we are more likely than any other racial group to be exposed to violence. And an, an additional unfortunate detail, very sad detail, 